Good evening, everybody. I'm Catherine Homan, Director of Philanthropy here at Museum of the Rockies. I'm so glad we could gather and talk about an exhibit. Um, we're downstairs in the administration hall and right up above us, they're still installing this exhibit. So it's pretty exciting. It's just kind of ongoing and we're glad you could join us tonight. I'm joined here by Callie Hamilton, who directs our annual giving and our um, membership program. So by virtue of you being members, Callie's kind of your person here at Museum of the Rockies. I have a few housekeeping things. Uh, we're gonna have an opportunity to have a question and answer uh, session with curator John Scanella, Dr. Scanella, who's joining us. And you can submit those questions if you click on the question and answer box on your screen. Um, and also when the videos begin, you can adjust your view using the line and the square shape controls and they're up at the upper right part of your screen. So we'll kind of spell you through this as we go. Um, and first uh, we're gonna have a message from our executive director, Chris Dobbs. Welcome and thank you for attending our first ever virtual exhibit opening. We appreciate your renewing your membership during this unpredictable year. Because of your membership and annual giving support, we are able to continue to offer exciting, changing exhibits in 2021. Tonight, we will hear from Dr. John Scanella, the John R. Horner Curator of Paleontology. John will share his expertise and highlight some of the museum's marine fossils. You will be the first to discover the exhibit Savage Ancient Seas. This short program will be followed by a question and answer session with museum staff. You can submit your questions tonight by putting them in the chat box. I want to give you a few museum updates. Voyager, the never-ending journey, is now showing in the Taylor Planetarium. After Savage Ancient Seas, The Vikings Begin opens on May 29th. And Environmental Impact 2 and National Geographic's Women, A Century of Change opens on October 9th. This year, we are working hard on creating a schedule of virtual and in-person programs. We want to hear what membership looks like for you. Look for a survey in the coming months. Please join me with a virtual round of applause as we thank our exhibit sponsors, Sabane Stillwater and the Gilhausen Family Foundation. I hope you enjoy the Savage Ancient Seas exhibit. I know you're as jazzed as I am about the Savage Ancient Seas exhibit. It's going on. Uh, it's getting put together at this last minute upstairs, right up above us. We're downstairs in the admin hall and they're up there still installing this. So it's right up to the minute. Um, you'll be able to see it tomorrow. Um, before John Scanella, Dr. Scanella shares with you some marine fossils from our own collection, I'd like to play a little trivia game with all of you. And Callie, uh, has some great questions. All right, so here in a minute, you will get a, um, a little pop-up box on your screen and you'll be able to answer this question. We'll see how everybody does. So the first question is, what is the name of the warm shallow sea that is co that covered large portions of North America during the Cretaceous period? Is it the Great American Seaway, the Great Plains Shipping Channel or the Western Interior Seaway? And I will give you some time to answer that. All right, it looks like the polling is slowing down. I'll give you about five more seconds. All 
right. Let's see what everybody thought. Okay, here's the results. It looks like most of you got that correct. It's the Western Interior Seaway. And this is the um, body of water that a lot of the, the um, critters you'll see upstairs lived in. All right, we'll have a couple more of those throughout the night. So um, get your thinking caps on. And so, so now, oh, go ahead. <laughs> So Dr. John Scanella is our curator of paleontology and you have a chance to hear from him. Any chance I get, I always take it because I learn something new and his enthusiasm for his topic is just, it's unparalleled. I um, want to tell you that he's an expert in the Triceratops, my favorite dinosaur, but he's going to talk about some things that you can see at Museum of the Rockies when you come and visit. Hi, I'm John Scanella, the John R. Horner Curator of Paleontology at the Museum of the Rockies. Tyrannosaurus rex is one of the largest carnivorous animals that has ever walked the earth. It lived at the very end of the Cretaceous period, a period of time that lasted from about 145 to 66 million years ago. And during that time, while T-Rex and other dinosaurs reigned on land, the seas were filled with different groups of reptiles entirely some of which grew to rival or even exceed T-Rex in size. Let's meet some of the creatures that you might encounter if you ever decided to go for a swim in the savage ancient seas. This is the skull of a mosasaur. Mosasaurs were a group of marine reptiles that evolved during the Cretaceous period and developed into a number of different species. Here is fossil of a mosasaur uh, from downstairs in the paleo collections at the museum. This is part of the snout of a smaller mosasaur. See the tip of the snout there and the teeth there. Uh, this mosasaur skull that's on display uh, is from a much larger animal. If the entire skeleton was here on display, it would be in the neighborhood of about 30 feet in length. And some mosasaurs grew to be much bigger than that. Mosasaurs evolved from reptiles that once walked on land and they had a number of adaptations that helped them to maneuver in the seas. This is one of this mosasaur's limbs, and you can see that instead of being adapted to uh, grab onto the ground and walk around on land, it's evolved into a flipper to help it to maneuver through the water. Mosasaurs were top predators in their environment and had uh, many adaptations to help them catch and consume their neighbors in the sea. Uh, some of these include, if we look here at the lower jaw, this almost looks like a crack in the lower jaw, but actually it's a point uh, that allowed the jaws to expand around whatever the mosasaur wanted to eat. This mosasaur here has these long teeth to bite into its prey, and if we were to look down its throat, we could actually see a second set of teeth on the roof of its mouth. So anything that went into this mosasaur's jaws likely wasn't getting out. This is one of the reasons why if I was to travel back to the Cretaceous, I would probably stay out of the water. This is the shell of an ammonite. Ammonites were ancient relatives of the modern octopus and squid. Uh, but unlike the octopus and squid today, an ammonite had this, this elaborate shell that its body was inside of. Uh, like its modern cousins, it had a number of arms that it used to acquire food. Ammonites came in a variety of shapes and sizes. This here is the fossil of a, a smaller ammonite, and if we look inside of it, you can see there's a number of chambers within the shell, which would be filled with gas to help with buoyancy of the animal while, as it was swimming. And the, the last and largest chamber would contain most of the body of the ammonite. Ammonites were, ammonites were an important component of their ecosystem and also served as food for some of the marine reptiles in the environment. This is part of the shell of an ammonite with these interesting circles in them, which may be the results of an attack from a mosasaur.
This is a model of a plesiosaur named Edgarosaurus that once swam through the seaway that covered Montana in the Cretaceous period. Below it is the fossil that this reconstruction is based on. Plesiosaurs were another successful group of marine reptiles that came in a variety of forms. Some of them had short necks with a relatively large head, and uh, others had a smaller head with a much longer neck. Edgarosaurus here is an example of a short-necked plesiosaur. This here is the skull of a uh, plesiosaur with a much longer neck. Some of these long-necked plesiosaurs would have a neck over 20 feet in length. It's thought that they might use this neck to uh, kind of sneak into a school of fish with their little head while their body uh, hid in the depths below and thus were able to sneak up on their prey. If you were to look up to the skies above the seaway that stretched across North America in the Cretaceous period, there's a good chance you might see flying reptiles soaring by. These animals called pterosaurs were the first vertebrates to take to the skies and were close relatives of the dinosaurs. This here is part of the humerus, the upper arm bone, from a pterosaur from Montana named Montanus Darko. And the animal that had this bone uh, had a wingspan of about eight feet, which is pretty big. This is a cast of uh, the same bone, the uh, humerus, uh, from a pterosaur from Texas called Quetzalcoatlus. And this pterosaur was the size of a small plane. So pterosaurs came in a variety of shapes and sizes and were a very successful group of animals throughout the Mesozoic era. The fossil record provides a window onto the deep history of life on Earth and how it's changed over time. Did you know that in the Cretaceous period, there was a large shallow seaway that extended over much of North America? And while dinosaurs and other creatures reigned on land, different groups of organisms entirely evolved in the savage ancient seas. Okay, so I promise you pretty soon you will get a look at the exhibit. Um, we have something to share with you here in just a little bit, but before we do, we have one more trivia. Well, we have a couple more trivia questions, but here's one more for you. This one's a stumper. So I'll get ready. And how did marine reptiles like Elasmosaurus and Tylosaurus breathe? They had to surface to breathe air. They did not have gills. They absorbed oxygen from the water. They had gills or they used scuba gear. And I'll give you just a little bit of time to answer this question. Okay, about five more seconds. All right, let's see what everybody answered. All right, most of you got this right. I got this wrong. So I'm impressed with you all. They had to surface to breathe air. Um, they did not have gills. So you'll be able to see, um, I know there's a Tylosaurus upstairs. I don't know if there's an elasmosaurus upstairs. Um, Dr. Scanella might be able to tell you, but you'll get to see some of these creatures when you go up, or hopefully you'll come in this weekend or sometime before May 2nd and check it out. But we can give you a little bit of a preview um, right now. Hi, I'm John Scanella, the John R. Horner Curator of Paleontology at Museum of the Rockies. 
The Savage Ancient Seas exhibit is going to allow museum visitors the opportunity to dive into the underwater world of the Western Interior Seaway, the vast body of water which once covered much of North America in the late Cretaceous period towards the end of the age of dinosaurs. This body of water once extended all the way from the Gulf of Mexico up to the Arctic and was filled with spectacular bizarre animals, some unlike anything alive today. Some of the animals living in the seaway included the mosasaurs, carnivorous marine reptiles like Tylosaurus, which looks something like if you were to imagine a 45-foot-long Komodo dragon that was adapted to live in the water, or the plesiosaurs, such as Elasmosaurus, an animal with a neck over 20 feet in length with a tiny little head filled with sharp teeth. And swimming amongst these marine reptiles were gigantic fish like Xyphactinus, which could easily swallow you or I whole. And flying above the seaway were the bizarre flying reptiles, the pterosaurs, which might swoop down to catch fish. I think this exhibit will be exciting for museum visitors of all ages. It presents these animals in three dimensions, so you can really get the feel for what it might be like to be swimming in the seaway and encounter one of them up close. It also has the educational content regarding the history of the seaway, how the earth has changed over time, and how the animals living in the sea evolved. It's also a way that Museum of the Rockies continues to bring the world to Montana. Many of the species on display in this exhibit have not been found in Montana as of yet, even though the seaway did extend over Montana. Some of the specimens on display in this exhibit have been found in Kansas and Texas and elsewhere in North America. So it gives us a chance to see some of these creatures that we don't normally get to see on display here in Montana. I'm excited to see some of these animals up close, so please join me for a swim in the savage ancient seas. All right, so there you could get a look of some of what is happening um, right now in that exhibit hall. It's coming together wonderfully. Um, just a reminder, if you have any questions, we'll do um, the Q&A here in just a minute after one more um, trivia question. So if you have questions, go ahead and make sure to put them in that Q&A box down at the bottom. Um, anything that you wanna ask Dr. Skinnell about paleontology or this exhibit, marine, uh, marine reptiles, and while you're thinking of those questions, we'll ask you one final trivia question. All right, some Mosasaur specimens of Tylosaurus were known to have many injuries and bite marks on their bones. Who likely caused these injuries? Was it another large Tylosaurus, a great white shark, or large bony fish like Zephactinus? All right, we've almost got everybody voted. How about five more seconds? Okay. You guys are, are sharp. Once again, majority of you got it right. It was another large Tylosaurus. Um, so they uh, don't know for sure why, but they think it could have been um, an injury from breeding or, um, oh, I have to look, I wrote it down so that I wouldn't forget, um, or a territorial dispute. And so um, maybe Dr. Scanella will talk about that a little bit in the Q&A if you have more questions. So uh, now it's your turn to ask the questions. So go ahead and send them on over to the Q&A and um, I will turn this over to Catherine and Dr. Scanella. All right, so I just want to prime people who haven't asked a question because they're too shy. Um, this brings us together as lifelong learners. So I just think putting yourself in the place of being a paleontologist and everything you've wondered about. And so um, some of these questions, I think that um, just make a lot of sense. And, and John loves to talk about paleontology. So I seem to recall hearing that dinosaurs were not true reptiles. Were the mosasaurs and other marine reptiles true reptiles? 
Over to you, John. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, thanks for the, uh, the great question about reptiles. So reptiles today are represented by a number of different animals. There's lizards, there's snakes, there's crocodiles, um, and some reptiles, some of these reptiles share more features in common with one another. And so they can be grouped in more specific groupings. So dinosaurs are members of a group of reptiles called um, archosaurs. And living archosaurs today include things like crocodilians and birds, and they all share more features with each other than they do with other reptiles. So the marine reptiles that are in the Savage Ancient Seas exhibit are also reptiles, but they're more distantly related uh, to dinosaurs than crocodiles or birds are. So for example, an animal like a mosasaur, like the skull that uh, is here behind me, is a reptile, but it's much more closely related to animals like the Komodo dragon and snakes. It doesn't fall within that group that's more closely related to dinosaurs that actually includes birds. Uh, so in a sense, birds today are a group of reptiles, which is kind of cool when you think about it. Great, thank you, John. Here's another one along those lines um, about mosasaurs. Did they get to be as large as the ones in Jurassic World? <laughs> oh, that's, that's a good question. So uh, for those of you who've seen the Jurassic World movie, there is a very large mosasaur, far, far larger than uh, this specimen behind me. Uh, and I think estimates based on its appearances in the movie suggest that it was larger than a blue whale, uh, probably well over 100 feet in length. So the fossil evidence of, of mosasaurs indicates that these marine reptiles got to be very large. Um, the Tylosaurus on, uh, on display in Savage Ancient Seas, for example, is in the neighborhood of 45 feet in length, which is, which is pretty big. Um, some specimens may have gotten larger than that. There's uh, some examples of mosasaurus, close relatives of this animal here, that uh, may have been larger than that based on uh, partial skeletons and pieces that have been found. It's estimated that they may have reached into the neighborhood of 55 feet or so in length. So these are, these are really big animals, but nowhere near the, the size of the Mosasaurus that's uh, portrayed in the Jurassic World movie. But still, I think that if you were swimming through the seaway and you saw a 50 foot long Mosasaur approaching you, it would be just as terrifying as if the Mosasaur was over hundred feet in length. Nice. Next question, where are the fossils of marine reptiles found in Montana? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, the Western Interior Seaway, there's deposits of it across Eastern Montana. If you drive out to Eastern Montana, you, you'll come across areas where there's these low rolling kind of grayish hills. And a lot of that is what's known as the Bear Paw Formation, which is uh, the deposition out from this uh, Western Interior Seaway. And Museum of the Rockies has actually been doing a lot of field work out in the deposits of the seaway over the last few summers um, in areas in the northeastern part of the state. And we've been going out and discovering new examples of mosasaurs and some plesiosaur material and lots of shelled ammonites and other creatures. So making lots of exciting discoveries in the seaway. So I think we'll continue to learn a lot more about what life was like under the waves of Montana uh, in the Cretaceous period. Thank you, John. Here's one that calls on everybody to do a little imagination. Is there any evidence that dinosaurs fell into the mouths of these creatures or did they only eat other sea creatures or can we only imagine? That's a good question. That's a really good question. And um, I'm trying to think if there's any direct evidence of uh, like mosasaur bite marks or anything like that on dinosaur bones. Certainly dinosaurs could have fallen into the mouths of these marine reptiles because we know this because dinosaur fossils have been found in these seaway deposits. And the way this may have happened is through a process that's called bloat and float. Uh, sometimes a, a, a land animal might die uh, and then as it's decaying, its body fills with gases. So when it happens to fall into the seaway, it can kind of float out a ways uh, and be, be a, scavenged upon by some of the creatures out in the seaway. And in that way, you might find bits and pieces of dinosaurs that have kind of floated out into the sea and, be, and been deposited on the seaway bottom. So, so yes, it's, it's uh, 
Mosasaurs and plesiosaurs and other creatures probably did know what dinosaurs tasted like. All right, there's the next two questions are from kids or um, funneled through their parents. Um, Sasha asks, my four and a half year old wants to know, was the Myosaurus the top predator? Mo Mosasaurus? Um, Mosasaurus, yeah. sorry. <laughs> so the Mosasaurus probably at the time probably was the top predator in, in the seaway, though it was a seaway filled with predators and they made their way, uh, made livings in different ways, eating different things. But just in the Western Interior Seaway, you had predatory giant fish, you had large plesiosaurs of different shapes and sizes, and a variety of mosasaurs. And certainly the largest of those more, the largest of the mosasaurs would have been able to eat pretty much whatever they wanted out of all the other creatures in the seaway. So yes, it's likely the, the big mosasaurs were probably the top predators of the Western Interior Seaway. A great follow-up from Cole, who's age six. He wants to know, uh, why do mosasaurs eat small fish? Well, uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, so some mosasaurs were smaller and, and probably would have you know, enjoyed eating smaller fish. For larger mosasaurs, uh, they might have eaten fish of all sizes, including some of the gigantic fish that we see in the uh, seaway. Uh, like Zyphactinus is a, is a huge fish that could reach nearly 20 feet in length and uh, could also eat really big fish itself. Uh, but mosasaurs of various sizes, we would eat all kinds of animals in their environment, including uh, fish of various sizes, depending on how hungry they were, I suppose. Pamela wants to know, she lives in Billings. Um, tell me what life in the seas would have been like in the Yellowstone Valley. Uh, so Yellowstone Valley, I'm trying to think of deposits of the seaway right next to um, Billings. Um, right, right around Billings, you have the Rim Rocks, which are kind of the, uh, I think that's a delta deposit near the seaway, having to do with the seaway expanding and contracting over time in the Cretaceous period. Uh, and there's likely lots of, uh, yeah, there's some plesiosaur material I know of in, in the, near the area. So. There are deposits of the seaway near Billings and where you could find, oh, there's one on display here. Uh, the, the Billings plesiosaur, as it's called, that was found right next to Billings. And this was a deposit in what's known as the Thermopolis Formation, I believe, which is a slightly older part of the Western Interior Seaway. And it's a short-necked plesiosaur as opposed to a Lasmosaurus, which has this really long neck and tiny head. Some plesiosaurs had a shorter neck and a larger head, uh, so they were probably making a living in a different way than the long-necked plesiosaurs. But there's a really a good example of that uh, known from Billings. Thank you, John. Jackie wonders, how deep was the sea? Great question. So the Western Interior Seaway was, relatively speaking, a shallow uh, sea. But still, it was pretty deep. Uh, uh, it's estimated to have been in the neighborhood of maybe two or 3,000 feet, I think, is maximum depth which sounds deep, but the Mediterranean Sea, I think is in the neighborhood of like 15 to 17,000 uh, feet maximum depth. So it's a relatively shallow inland sea, but still deep enough to contain lots and lots of exciting animals. Can you talk a little bit about the timeline, line, like when this was all happening? Um, the timeline for the Western Interior Seaway. So, uh, it extends over a large part of the late Cretaceous period. Uh, I think the oldest deposits representing parts of the seaway in Montana uh, or, or that are known in North America date to about 100 million years ago or so. And, and it began to form due to the collision of tectonic plates that caused some uplifting and some depression of the middle part of North America. And at the time, there were no um, ice caps, and so sea levels were higher. And this caused the formation of the Western Interior Seaway. And over time, uh, through tectonic processes, the sea levels would fluctuate. So at times, the sea would be wider, and at other times, it would be narrower. Uh, and so it's kind of cool that in Montana, there are places you can go and, and stand and see sea deposits, and then see where the sea kind of uh, 
uh, narrowed, and so then there's land deposits above that, and then the sea expands again, and there's sea deposits above that. So you can literally walk up hills and find marine creatures, and then terrestrial land creatures like dinosaurs, and then go above that and find uh, plesiosaurs and animals like that. Or pterosaur wings like bat wings? Ah, this is a great question. So pterosaurs were the flying reptiles that are sometimes found in the deposits of the Western Interior Seaway and are also known from elsewhere. Um, and they're often they might be thought to have sort of like bat wings because they, they don't have feathery bird wings, but they have these leathery looking wings. But if you look at the wing of a bat uh, up close, basically it's, it's kind of the hand of the bat and the membrane of the wing is extended between the bat's fingers. And a pterosaur does something kind of similar, but not really at all. Because if you look at the wing of a pterosaur, typically they have three, three free fingers. And then this finger here just extends for the entire length of the wing. So uh, basically it's just using this one massive finger to support the wing membrane. And these are flying creatures. Some of them have a wingspan over 30 feet in length. And basically they're flying around using one, one finger uh, on each side, which is, which is kind of amazing. So from a distance, it kind of looks sort of like a bat wing, but when you look at the details of how the bones are arranged, it's, it's, a, it's very different. Terry is wondering, did Mosasaurs have live birth? Ah, that is a great question. So uh, there's good evidence that lots of the marine reptiles had live birth. For example, plesiosaurs. Uh, there's uh, an example of a plesiosaur found with an unborn plesiosaur inside of it that's quite large, which suggests that plesiosaurs gave birth to pretty large young plesiosaurs and probably not many young plesiosaurs. So we know that plesiosaurs gave birth to live young. There's another group of marine reptiles called the ichthyosaurs, uh, which looked something like uh, if you imagine a dolphin, but if it was kind of more like a lizardy dolphin. Uh, and there's very famous examples of ichthyosaurs, which have been preserved um, with the, the mother ichthyosaur expelling uh, an unborn uh, plesiosaur, uh, I'm sorry, ichthyosaur into the world, and then that's fossilized like that. So we know that ichthyosaurs gave live birth. So based on that, it's, it's been thought that Mosasaurs likely gave live birth as well. However, interestingly, just recently, I think in uh, 2020, a uh, paper was published describing a really large, strange, soft egg uh, found in Antarctica, um, which based on the study of, of the eggshell, uh, appears to be most similar to animals that are closely related to mosasaurs that are alive today. And it's, it's a really big egg, and mosasaur remains are known from that area. And so it's been suggested that could this be an egg from a mosasaur? And that certainly appears to be possible. So um, one of the neat things about mosasaurs and other marine reptiles is that we, we still have a lot to discover and learn about how, how their, their life cycle, how they grew up from little babies to adults. And so I think that's one example of, of uh, more exciting discoveries that are still to come as we try to learn more about mosasaurs when they were very, very little. Did they hatch out of eggs or were they uh, born live into the world? Thanks, John. Are you game for a few more questions? Sure. All right. Here's a very specific one coming from Robert. Regarding small, the small pterosaur bone you showed, were more than that found? Where was it found? And is it part of the new exhibit? Oh, great, great question. So that small pterosaur bone uh, was part of the humerus, the upper arm bone of a pterosaur named Montanus Darko, which was found in Montana, uh, I believe in the northwestern part of the state in the Two Medicine Formation. So the geologic formation where we find Myasaura, the state dinosaur. Um, so Montanus Darko is known from there. Uh, pterosaur fossils are, are extremely rare in the fossil record, in part because the bone is super, super thin. They were very lightly constructed. And so to find any pterosaur material is usually very, very exciting because uh, they break apart very easily. So for Montanus Darko, there was, um, 
part, part of the wing and some other bits and pieces of that animal um, that are downstairs in the paleo collections. Uh, that's not part of the new uh, Savage Ancient Seas exhibit. Thank you. Um, this is one that I've always wondered about. Um, what do you know what color any of the dinosaurs were? So I think this is a more general question, but it's fascinating. That's a great question. So not that long ago, uh, it, it, you would say, well, we'll never know what color dinosaurs were because they're extinct. You can't, you can't see dinosaurs. But more recently, as more discoveries have been made, and it's been found, for example, that many dinosaurs are preserved if you have uh, exceptional uh, conditions where you can see delicate structures, dinosaurs have been found with feathers uh, preserved on their bodies. And close study of the feathers of some of these dinosaurs uh, reveal structures that are known as melanosomes that are found in feathers of animals today. And so, Studying these uh, fossil feathers, uh, paleontologists can look at what these structures might look like. And so melanosomes basically uh, kind of give an indication of color based on their morphology, their shape. So for example, a, a melanosome that looks like this might mean that it was, might correlate with black colors. Uh, another melanosome might indicate a red coloration and so on. And so paleontologists looking at these possible melanosomes in dinosaurs with feathers are able to reconstruct some of the possible colors that these animals have. So for example, there is a, a small theropod dinosaur in China named uh, Sinoceratrix, which based on these studies of potential melanosomes uh, appears to have had an orange and white striped tail. Uh, and there's another uh, small uh, dinosaur named Anchiornis, which kind of had a uh, speckled appearance to its feathers, sort of like you see in a starling. And then down its, uh, the middle of its head, it had like a red mohawk. So uh, studies of these, these melanosomes suggest that dinosaurs may have been very colorful, uh, more colorful than uh, old reconstructions where they're all kind of gray and green and kind of drab looking. And this is consistent with what we see with dinosaurs having lots of visual display structures on them like horns and spikes and frills. So not only did they have cool spikes and frills and things, but they also may have been very elaborately colored. All right, so Callie, do we have time for one more question for John? I think one more. Okay, I'm gonna choose the, because again, folks, these, this is a set of lifelong learners and and now I'm gonna be wandering around and asking these questions of John just for the duration, warning. All right, John, how many teeth do most Morris, Mo, Mosasauruses have? I'm stumbling. Oh, wow. <laughs> I think you got me on that one. I, I, haven't, I haven't counted the teeth in this Mosasaur, but quite a few. And uh, I, don't, I think I pointed out in one of the videos, not only do they have uh, these teeth that you can see out here, but also an extra set of teeth on the roof of the mouth that they would use to hold their prey in place. Uh, so Mosasaurs, I, I don't have an exact number for you, I'm sorry, but they have a lot of teeth and a lot of scary teeth. <laughs> so. Okay, I lied. One more. Okay. How long, or I guess wide, can the wingspan of the flying reptile get? Oh, so flying reptiles like pterosaurs, well, first of all, pterosaurs come in a variety of sizes. Some were uh, very small and some were gigantic. And probably the largest uh, pterosaurs include animals like Quetzalcoatlus, uh, known from Texas, which had a wingspan, which has been estimated to be somewhere over 30 feet in length. And there's some uh, fragmentary specimens uh, other species of pterosaurs that might have been even larger than that. So basically, it's a flying reptile the size of a, a, a small plane, uh, or some of the largest flying reptiles of the Mesozoic. So interesting. John Scanella, thank you so much. Can we give a round of virtual applause? I just, I find this stuff infinitely fascinating, and I want to say thank you. And Callie, over to you. Great. And I'm sorry if we didn't get to your questions. Um, I think there are 33 more, no, more than that, 
almost 50 more questions. Um, so there's no way we could get through them all tonight. I do know having um, walked through the exhibit, you can find answers to some of those when you come to the museum. Um, hopefully we can archive this list of questions too and um, maybe follow up with members somehow um, through social media or something with some of these good questions you guys have. So um, there were a couple of questions that were specific to this exhibit that we can go ahead and answer. Um, the, somebody was wondering what the hours were, and of course we should have told you that. Um, th so this exhibit opens tomorrow at 9 a.m. and we're open daily from nine to four and it goes through May 2nd, I believe. Um, so you have a few months to come check it out. It is in both galleries, that was another question. Um, so it's spread out through where we normally have our changing exhibits in, in both spaces, so it's huge. There are so many specimens. Um, you guys are going to love it. Come in and check it out. Um, before we let you go though, I just wanted to um, share with you a few benefits of your museum membership that you might not even know you have or some opportunities that are coming up that are just for members. Um, if you are interested in summer camps, there are still two more days to register before they open to the public. So this year we were able to give members um, the first shot at summer camp. So there's only about 30 spaces left. So um, if you're a member, you want summer camps, they're always fantastic. Get online and sign up for those before Monday when they open to the public. Uh, Mr. Dillon is still doing tours for TOTS a few times a month. And right now those are for members only too because we have to keep um, the group small. So check out our calendar for that. Um, don't forget your store discount. Uh, all members get a 10% discount. If you are a um, higher level member, you get a higher discount. Our store just got remodeled. It's got a lot of new, there's a lot of new product in there. It's um, gorgeous. There's a lot of fun things. So make sure you check that out and use your store discount when you come in to check out Savage Ancient Seas. And then finally, um, don't forget about the ASTC Passport Program. Uh, I know some members don't even know that it's part of their membership. So we're part of a network called the Association of Science and Technology Centers. And you can use um, your Museum of the Rockies membership to get free or discounted admission to over 370 museums around the world. Um, so, you know, all sorts of science museums like the Field Museum, um, there's museums in England, check them out. If you're going to travel, when it's safe to travel, when you feel safe to travel, be sure to hop on our website and find the link to that and see if there's any other museums you can check out with your Museum of the Rockies membership. And then finally, we just want to remind everybody that we are at limited capacity for right now. So this weekend will probably be busy as the exhibit opens. So if you're planning on coming in tomorrow or Sunday to check out the exhibit, make sure you get on our website. Um, at the very top, it says plan your visit and you can reserve a spot. Uh, you just have to put your membership information in. It won't cost you anything, but it just makes sure that you have a spot before we hit capacity. Um, but thank you all for coming. Uh, this was a very fun first virtual event. We hope to do more for you um, and we can't wait to see you all in person again um, for members openings in person. But in the meantime, uh, this was really fun and enjoy Savage Ancient Seas. <laughs>